God gave me a, a word for Judy, and basically what I told her was that, that and, I, and I think this is for all of us, that, that we have the ability to change the atmosphere in a room. And, and uh, oftentimes we think that, that in order to, in order for our, our voice to be heard, we have to use vocal expression, which I, I never heard anybody say this before until I said it, but we think that our voice always involves vocal expression, but our voice is so much more than vocal expression. When I say vocal expression, you know what I'm talking about. So it's what we what comes out of our mouth, the, the words that come out of our mouth. But as I was sitting and talking with Judy and, and God was downloading stuff through me into her, I realized that that our voice, the sound that's in us, doesn't always have to be vocal expression. Our voice is much more than that. It's much louder than that. And and we're so conditioned to think that that in order to change the atmosphere in a room, that we have to use vocal expression to do it. But that's not true. We have the we have the ability, and we have within us the 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 anointing and the spirit of God to change the atmosphere in any room that we're in. And especially when we're in a room and we're in unity with two or three other other believers. And it's important when I when I say you you can't just be in the room with them. You have to be in unity with them. Your spirits have to be yoked together. Yes. They have to be tied together. Yes. Because you can be we could all be sitting here today and, and not be in unity. Even though we could be in agreement with each other and be friends with each other doesn't mean our spirits are in, in agreement and in unity. And one of the things that, that we need to do as a church, as, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the church, and, and then specifically about today, Everyone that's in this room is this is is this church. It's, it's the church that's that's present in this room. But one of the things that we need to that we need to uh, press in with God all the time is to uh, allow unity to take place. I was going to say we need to strive for unity, but that's the wrong word. We need. To, because God wants us to be in unity. The Holy Spirit wants us to be in unity. And, and the way this works is we, each of us, have to be in unity with God. Think of, a, think of all the relationships in this room as triangles. My wife and I have a triangle. Cindy and I have a triangle relationship. I have a relationship with God and think of the top of the triangle being God, and God has a relationship with me. There's a line going from God down to me. Cindy has her own relationship with God. There's a line going down to her, and the bottom of that triangle is the relationship between Cindy and I. Now ours is a husband-wife relationship, so it has its own, uh, there's a uniqueness about the marriage relationship, true a true marriage relationship. So there's a there's a uniqueness to that relationship. But that same triangle relationship is actually in effect with each and every one of us in the room. So so the enemy is always trying to tear that triangle apart. Because if he can take one of those legs of that of that triangle out then it weakens and, and sort of destroys it. Well, Satan has no access to your to God. So in other words, Satan obviously he cannot destroy God. He can't take God out. 
So the point of the triangle, the top of the triangle, is 100% guaranteed safe, cannot be touched, cannot be damaged, cannot be destroyed. But the connecting line, that relationship is the line between between you and God, that connection, he can attack that connection. But he has limited uh, access to it because, because the top of it is connected to God. So that automatically keeps that line a little bit stronger. So think of this triangle. There's, there's six parts to the triangle. There's three points and three lines. So the six parts. Well, five of those parts are sort of susceptible, if you will, to the attack or, or of, of Satan. And obviously, he's restricted in what he can do at all times by God. He, he never has, Satan never has just absolute free reign to do whatever he wants. He's always, he's always under the, he's got sort of a limited range of, of what he can do. But he does have access to those other five points. The, the connections between you and God, you yourself have a susceptible, uh, you have to, these are things that have to be guarded mm -hmm. and protected. And then the connection between you and, and whatever other person that you're coming into unity with. And, uh, I'm not even sure why I'm talking about this because this isn't the message. But, but, but as a as a body, those triangles have tremendous uh, authority and power, but more authority than power. Because there's a difference between power and authority. And I grew up uh, wanting God's power in my life. But I never really thought much about authority. And uh, but, but God has given us authority and real power comes from authority. So, so people that are seeking power outside of God's authority, it, it's, it's like that power is a, is a uh, counterfeit. It's not real power. It can be, it can, it can manifest like power and it can have the appearance of having power, but if it's not, if, it, if that power doesn't come from authority, then it's, it's not real power real true power comes from authority so when you're in a room no matter how big or how small the room is and no matter how many people are in the room and what's going on in the room as a as a child of god and as a as a uh, a christian in right standing with god you automatically have authority in that room which which also if you have authority, you have power. But you have to come into agreement with the authority that you have in order to access the power. And if you have, if there's two or three of you in the room, and you're in, not only in that triangle relationship with God and unity with Him, with the authority that He's given, but you're also that bottom connection, you're in, in agreement with each other as as Christians and what God wants to do in the room then you have then you have an amazing amount of authority and power to change the atmosphere in the room and uh, I think sometimes what's happened in the church is that we have we have gotten away from that we've gotten away from from the realization that the church is the body of christ it's not just the pastor it's not just the guy 
that's using vocal expression. Because, because when, when everybody that's here came in here today, every person has a need today. And some of, probably most of us have more than one. But everybody walked into this room needing something from this body, from, from, from the church. But you also walked in here as the answer to somebody's need. You have, you have something to give today. That doesn't mean that you're going to be required to use vocal expression. But when, when, when you walk in, when you go through your life, you need to go through your life with the realization and understanding that everywhere you go, when you walk into a room or when you walk into a situation, you're walking in that situation with the answer to somebody's need. But it requires you to constantly be in that, in that relationship with Holy Spirit so that you can access and be in agreement with the authority that he's, that he's given you, which is your voice, which can change the atmosphere in the room. Even if you're the only one in the room, you still have that authority. You still have that, that ability to change the atmosphere. And uh, so everybody here today has a voice, and you need to exercise it. You need to, you need to, you need to be aware and cognizant of the fact that I'm I'm here to receive, and I'm here to give. I'm here, I'm here to be blessed, and I'm here to be part of what God is doing in the room, and and to change the atmosphere. Now, I've shared with you that that my mission, my my purpose, my uh, assignment is to change the country, to change the world. And the only way I can do that is by changing the room. Mm, right. <clears throat> and that should that and and everything that everything that God wants to do is he wants to do in this room today. So everything that is said, everything that is done is vitally important. And it's and it's it's also important that each one of us come into uh, what I call spiritual unity with each other to accomplish what God wants to happen. What God gave me this week is uh, out of 2 Samuel chapter 19. And uh, a couple, three weeks ago, we were sitting out on the deck one night with uh, my nephew and a group of his friends, a bunch of uh, young 20-something-year-old young people. Uh, and they were all, most, mostly all guys, uh, my nephew's friends that are involved in business with him. And, and uh, really, a kind of a neat bunch of guys because they're, they're all young. They, they, they're, uh, they're starting uh, a business venture together, and they're just full of excitement for the future. For their own lives, rightfully so. They're they're very intelligent. They're all good-looking guys. They're they're uh, right now they're all single and they're they're uh, they're just pursuing their life. And and so we were sitting out on the deck and and uh, since they were all young and boisterous and full of energy and and uh, they mostly were controlling the conversation. They were talking about stuff that was interesting to them. They got to talking about music and 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 mostly secular music and and uh, they were they had this they did these uh, things where they would they would make a top 10 list of, of <laughs> musicians and then they would debate for hours and hours and hours 
who the order of this list. And they would, they would, it, this conversation went on for like an hour and a half, two hours about, well, this, this particular group and all of these, all of these groups, I didn't recognize any of them <laughs> because it was, it wasn't my right. generation and, right. and I don't like that kind of music anyway. But, uh, but they were, they were, it was a very spirited, lively conversation. It was fun just listening to them talk. So while they were talking, and they kept talking about this and that and so forth and so on, and they were all like little baby and big baby and tiny baby and huge baby, all these different groups, and I didn't recognize any of them, didn't know who they were, didn't know any of their music or songs, never heard of them. So I'm sitting there, and, and I started, my mind started wandering a little bit, and I, so I composed my own top ten list. And I, I actually wrote it, I took my phone out and went to my notes section and just real quick made a list of the top, the, the first list that came to my mind was people in the Bible and, and, and sort of my Bible heroes. And I just made a real quick top ten list and, and right at the top of my list was David. And uh, so I actually showed the list to Scott and my wife and, and we actually talked about it a little bit and had a little bit of discussion about it. I didn't spend a lot of time making the list. I don't even know if I made the list again. I might change some of the names and so forth, but I think David would still be at the top. And uh, so out of Second Samuel is, is this story about David. And uh, I love King David. He, I just, I love King David. I love the fact that God said about King David that he was a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, there just aren't very many men in the Bible that God wrote their eulogies. That God wrote David's eulogy. Because all through the, the book of 1st uh, and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, all of the other kings of Israel were, were compared, most of them were compared to David, and every one of them came up short in God's, in God's, uh, uh, I don't want to say judgment, but uh, in God's view of these kings. They, he oftentimes, if you read th those books in the Old Testament, you'll see where it says, well, King so-and-so was a good king, but he wasn't as good as King yeah. David, because, and then, it, and then it'll often say, because David was a man after God's own heart, and that was God's opinion of, of David and uh, so so David is probably one of my one of my heroes he's one of he's one of the guys that I look at and, and study his life well in the, in the book of 2nd Samuel chapter 19 David if you're familiar with David's story you'll know that uh, his son Absalom tried to overthrow or or actually led a rebellion and, and literally took over the throne from David. And uh, if you read uh, chapters 15, 16, 17, you'll, you'll read the story of Absalom and how Absalom led this rebellion. Absalom would sit outside the, the city gate and when people would come to, and, and remember Absalom was David's son, his firstborn son. And Absalom would sit outside the gate and when people would come to uh, bring their problems to the king, because that, that was how, that was part of the king's responsibility. And if somebody had a problem that couldn't be solved at the lower levels or or through the local jurisdiction, then they would come and make their petition or bring their complaint or their problem, their challenge to the king, and the king would rule. The king would, would, would decide, well, this is how we're going to solve this issue. And so if you had a complaint with your neighbor or a complaint with uh, somebody and it couldn't be solved in, the, in sort of like the lower courts or with a lower authority, eventually it would get to the king. So the king was sort of like the the uh, like what we would think of as being the supreme court mm -hmm. of the of our country, and so Absalom would sit outside the the city, and as people would be bringing their problems to 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 the king, 
Absalom would call out to them as they were walking by, and he would just engage them in conversation. Now, Absalom was a very good-looking man, a lot like Bobby here. And so he would, he would sit out there, and, and he, he was attractive. He, he had positioned himself so that people walking by would see him. He made himself public. He hired men that would actually, their job was to sort of promote himself to promote Absalom. He had money so he could he hired men that would that would point to Absalom, say, look how look how look at Absalom. And they would direct people to Absalom and he would be sitting there beside the gate. And as people would be walking in, Absalom would, would say, Hey, why why what are you coming to see the king about? And and they had no reason to doubt, after all he's the king's son and, and so he would say, Oh, I, I'm having a uh, a problem with my neighbor or I have this situation going on and, and I have a dispute that I need settled and they can't seem to, to settle it at, at, you know, the local uh, ruler can't settle it so I, I have to bring it to the king. And so Absalom would sit there and just nonchalantly he would say, well, you know what? He said, if I were, if I were the king, this is what I would do. And almost always his solution would be in that person's favor. So everybody that would come, he would, he would give them the answer they wanted. He would give them the solution that, that they wanted. It might not be the right answer, and it might not be the, the proper answer, but he would say, well, if I were the king, I would, you, you obviously have been wronged, and, and you, would, you, would, you would deserve recompense, you would deserve uh, repatriation or whatever, and I would... This is how I would settle this dispute. And then the person would go in and see the king. The problem was Absalom didn't have any authority. So Absalom's solution, he could always tell the person whatever they wanted to hear because he didn't have to stand by the results right. of the decision that he made. So he did this for four years. And everybody that came to see the king Absalom would tell them what they wanted to hear. And so, over a period of four years, everybody that came to see the king, sometimes the king, because he was the king, he was his decision carried weight, and people had to live with the results of it. And his decision not only had to affect the person that was coming to see them, but it had to affect the other party as well. So oftentimes, his actual decision didn't go in their favor because he had the whole kingdom to think about. Yeah. And so there, they would leave that place saying, wow, I wish Absalom was king because Absalom sees things the way I see things. Now the truth of the matter was, if two men were coming to see the king and they both had their own side of the story, Absalom could tell both of them that he would rule in their favor. Because he wasn't making the decision. And in this way, he literally stole the hearts of the people out from underneath the, the very nose of his dad. It was, it was a horrible uh, way to do things. But the people bought it. And so after four years of this, and after enough people had sort of gone through this little trap that Absalom had made, Absalom finally got enough of a following that he met with a group of people and, and formed his own uh, cabal, if you will, his own kingdom, and he declared himself to be king over his dad. And you know the story how David, because David was more concerned about the kingdom of God than he was his own kingdom, he said, I'm not going to fight a civil war in Jerusalem because it will be the, it'll be the kingdom of God that gets damaged because that was David's attitude. Instead of David fighting a civil war in Jerusalem with his own son, David hightailed it out of town. Now, the other thing you need to understand is that David also knew that the hearts of the people had been, had been turned against him by Absalom's duplicity. So David knew that the, the hearts of the people were no longer with him. 
And so David, rather than fight a battle with his son Absalom in the confines of Jerusalem, sort of ran and left the city. Now you read that story and you'll know that, that eventually Absalom knew that his, his uh, claim to the throne, he knew it was false and he knew it was based on deception and lies and he knew that as long as his father David was alive that his claim was never going to stand because he knew the duplicity that it was built on. And he knew that he had been deceitful. And because he knew that, he also knew that in order for him to maintain or hold on to this, this uh, power that he'd created him for himself, he would have to kill his own dad. And so eventually, Absalom and his army caught up to David and his men, and they had a, a battle. And in that battle, Absalom was defeated. And when you read the story, you'll know that, that Absalom was killed. Funny thing about it was Absalom had this long hair that he was proud of. And in the battle, he was running through the forest on his riding his donkey. And the thing that he was the most proud of got caught in some tree branches. And he was literally hung by his own hair. And... The, the soldiers of David caught up to him and killed him and he was put to death and there was this battle that took place between Absalom's men and David's men and David's men won. So David has, in a sense, he's vanquished his enemy. Even though Absalom was his own son, he was, he was the enemy. And David's men fought this battle, and Absalom was killed, and the army of Absalom was routed. They had no more power. There was no more, there was no more authority in them. And while David's men were coming back to camp after this battle and after defeating Absalom and his soldiers, all of the followers of Absalom dissipated because once Absalom was dead, there was, no, there was nothing there to hold them together. And so Absalom, his, his claim, his, his revolution has been completely abolished. But the interesting thing in, in 2 Samuel 19 is that David didn't go running back to Jerusalem. In verse, uh, let's see. It says in verse 8 of chapter 19 so the king got up and took his seat in the gateway when the men were told the king is sitting in the gateway they all came before him meanwhile the Israelites had fled to their homes so all these men that had followed Absalom and bought into this revolution after Absalom was killed and their, and their army was defeated all of the stragglers all of the men that were left fled back to their homes probably hoping that no one would remember whose side they had chosen so they all fled back to their homes, and the entire nation of Israel is sort of left hanging in limbo because nobody knows who's in charge. So verse 9 says, Throughout the tribes of Israel, all the people were arguing among themselves. The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies. He is the one who rescued us from the hand of the Philistines. But now he has fled the country to escape from Absalom. And Absalom, whom we anointed to rule over us, has died in battle. So there, all of this discussion is going on throughout the country. And they're saying, you know, David was our king. He was the one that for years delivered us from our enemies. He was the one that went out and fought battles against the Philistines. He was the one that went out and secured our freedom. He was the one out and secured our borders. He was the one that always offered us protection. He was, the, he was our king. He was the one that, that brought us in to this time of prosperity. But then the argument was said, well, but yeah, but when Absalom rose up, David ran, and, and, and so, so there was debate and there was discussion about who, who the king was. And, and, and some of the people said, but Absalom was the one who uh, we anointed to rule over us, but he's dead now. 
And then that question is, in verse 10, they said, so why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? So King David, in verse 11, sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar, the priest, and he said, Ask the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his palace, since this is what's being said throughout Israel? Since what is being said throughout Israel has reached the king at his quarters. You are my relatives, my own flesh and blood. So why should you be the last to bring back the king? You are my... Uh, and say to a Mesa, Are you not my own flesh and blood? May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you are not the commander of my army for, the life, for life in place of Joab. He won over the hearts of the men of Judah, so that they were all of one mind, and they sent word to the king. Return you and all your men. Now here's the message that, that God gave me this week. And it's a simple question. Who's on the throne of your heart? Who's on the throne of your heart? You have a throne. It's called your heart. And you have absolute 100% control over who's going to sit on that throne. Now the problem is, for a lot of people, there's nobody on the throne because you never asked the King of Kings to sit on that throne. David, instead of rushing back to Jerusalem after his enemy had been defeated, Remember, there's no one on the throne. Absalom had chased David off the throne. The throne was in Jerusalem. The throne was at the palace. The throne was where the king had lived before. But because of Absalom's rebellion, because of the rebellion that Absalom led, there was nobody on the throne. But David, even though he defeated Absalom in battle and Absalom was dead, instead of David rushing back to the throne, he did what God does. He waited to be invited back. And he sent out messengers to the nation of Israel and he asked the question, why have you not invited me back to be your king? One of the one of the great challenges that I have about understanding God is I often understand why God gave man free will. Sometimes it seems like it would be so much easier if God would just be a dictator. If he would just... And, and I mean, obviously... There's lots of answers. Some of, them are, some of them are obvious answers. Some of them are a little deeper and, and require a little more thought. But there's obvious reasons why God gave man free will. But the truth is that we have free will. We have the choice to make. And God is asking the question today, why have I not been given, why have I not been given the throne of your heart? Why have you not asked me to be the king? Instead of David, after defeating Absalom and walking back triumphantly into Jerusalem and saying, okay, I defeated my enemy, so that makes me the king. David said, no, you need to invite me back. You need to bring me back to be the king. David knew and understood that the nation of Israel would never be whole, it would never be complete, and he would never be king unless he was invited by the people. David knew that the hearts of the people had been stolen. He knew that Absalom had deceived and, and many people had been living under the delusion that Absalom would make a better king than David would. Even though Absalom never was anointed by God, he had never been given the assignment by God, he had no authority from God. He was uh, a dictator. He was, he was uh, 
someone who had appointed himself to be king. But David understood and knew that the hearts of the people was where the power lay. And God today is asking this question. Who is on the throne of your heart? Who is it that you have appointed or asked to be the king? Now God has incredible power. And God could be a dictator. He could assume that authority. He could assume that place. But because of man's free will, because of how God operates, God is waiting today for you to decide who's going to be on the throne of your heart. David waited for the nation to come back and say, we want you to be king. And God is asking that question today. Who's on the throne of your heart? When you read on down, in verse 18 it says, They crossed at the ford to take the king's household over and to do whatever he wished. So the people finally came into agreement with each other and said, we want David to be king. But when they came to David, and David was waiting on one side of the river, he was waiting to be invited. He was waiting to be asked. He was waiting to be escorted to his proper place. Remember, David had the anointing of God. He had the assignment from God. He had the authority of God. But he was waiting for the people to make the choice to bring him back. And so finally, after this, after this discussion and after this argument that took place for a little time, they finally went down to the river and it says they led him or they escorted him over and they crossed at the ford to take the king's household over and to do whatever he wished. See, if you're going to, if you're going to make God the king of your heart, then that means you need to do it with the agreement that he's going to be the king. He's going to be in charge. You're going to do whatever it is he wishes. That was what was at stake. That's what's at stake in our nation today. That's what's at stake in our world. There's been a civil war. There's been a revolution. There's been, there's been uh, uh, false promises made. And men's hearts have been led away from God. And God is standing today and he's saying, who's going to be on the throne of your heart? We have an election coming up in November. It's the most crucial election of our lifetime. We're going to decide in November which way our country is going to go. We're going to decide in November whether we're going to be the country that was founded on freedom and founded uh, on our Constitution, or we're going to decide whether we're going to go and be socialist or communist or some other form of government. Never before in, in our history, in, in my lifetime, has it ever been so clear what's going to be decided in November. It's an incredibly important election, and every person needs to go and vote. But I'm telling you, there's something more important than that vote, and it's who's going to be on the throne of your heart. Who's going to be on the throne of the hearts of the people? Because if we, if we vote for the right person or the right person, a group of people, the right leadership in our country, but don't have the hearts of the people, we're going to lose. The battle is way bigger than the upcoming election. The battle is for the hearts of the people. The battle 
is for the hearts of the people of our country. And therefore, the battle starts in this room. It starts with my heart. It starts with your heart. And God is saying today, who's on the throne of your heart? This seems like such a basic question. It seems like such a simple question. It seems like it seems like this is like Sunday school basic 101. But I'm telling you, there is something so profound about this question today. Who's on the throne of your heart? Because God will never assume that place. He's waiting to be asked. He's waiting to be escorted. He's waiting for you to give him the right to rule and reign in your life. Jesus spoke about this in the book of Matthew when he when he talked about he said when it when it when a demon gets cast out of a person he said that demon will go out and kind of roam around but he said oftentimes that demon will come right back to where he was cast out and he'll find that room swept and empty and clean but the key word there is he'll find that room empty. Because just casting Satan out, just removing Satan from your life, just removing the enemy, just by defeating Absalom, it's not enough if you don't escort God to have that place. Because if your throne is empty, or if you think, well, I'm just going to I'm going to rule in my own heart. I'll be in charge. I'll be the one. I'll do what I want. I'll do what I think is best for me. Then your throne is empty. And I guarantee you that eventually there will be another Absalom that will come in and try to dictate and and try to sit on that throne. In the story in 2 Samuel, if you read all the way down through, there was always this, there was this debate that was never quite settled. And there was a lot of the Israelites that weren't sure if David should be given the throne back. And because of that debate, because of that uh, indecisiveness, there was, in fact, another person that tried to usurp that authority. And if you read chapter 20, you'll see that there ended up being another revolt. There ended up being another usurper that David and his men then had to go out and continue the civil war. And what I'm saying to you today is it's not enough for you to cast out the enemy or to defeat the enemy. You need to take the next step and you need to invite God to be on the throne of your heart to have absolute rule and reign in every decision that you make. This is a decision that you have to make every day. It's a decision you have to make all the time. It's a constant decision. It's not, it's not a one and done type of a deal. Remember, David had been the king for some 30 years when all this took place. You would have thought his throne would have been firmly established. You would have thought there would be no way that, that the, the people of Israel would turn on him. He was a great king. He had, he had conquered all their enemies. He had brought them peace and prosperity. There was peace and prosperity in the land. People were living in safety and security. It was a wonderful time to be alive. But it was in that peace and prosperity that this usurper Absalom came in and literally replaced David. And the same thing will happen to you. You need to guard the throne of your heart. And you need to be sure that God is constantly invited and kept as, as the king of your own heart. We will never turn the hearts of the people of our country back to God if he's not on the throne of our heart. All week long I've been waiting and asking God, what is it about this truth that you want to show me? What is it? 
and all I got was this truth is way deeper and way bigger than what I can say. It seems so simple, but it is so profound. Who's on the throne of your heart today? Have you invited the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, to rule and to reign on the throne of your heart? Who's on the throne of our heart? Is God standing on the other side of the river today? Waiting. Mm -hmm. Waiting to be invited. Waiting to be escorted to that throne. Mm -hmm. i never forget I was in a church service one night. And as I was as the service was going on I, I, I left the service and I was sort of walking back and forth back in the in the back of the auditorium in the back of the of the church and I had this I had this mind picture of so many churches and so many Christians and I saw, I saw this mind picture of God standing outside, outside the church with his, with his hands on the window and his face pressed up against the window. And asking the question, boy, I'd like to come in there. I'd like to be, I'd like to be in there. But what God was showing me is that a lot of Christians... They have all the trappings of God. They have all of, they sing the right songs. They do the right things. They have, they, they sort of have kicked the enemy out, but they haven't invited the Holy Spirit to, be, to sit on the throne. And the sad thing is that there's a lot of Christian that God has got his face pressed up against the window like this. And he's, he's looking in. And, and just like David was standing on the side of the river, looking across the river, just waiting to be invited, waiting to be escorted back to his proper place, to the throne that was his by, by God's anointing, by God's authority. But David knew he couldn't get there without being invited, without being asked until the hearts of the people invited him back and escorted him back. And sad be the case that there's a lot of Christians that God is like, I'm just waiting to be invited. Waiting to be asked. Folks, that's the battle that we're facing today. It's not going to be enough to put the right political leaders in power. It's not going to be enough to vote for the right people. We've got to change the hearts of people. We've got to change the hearts of a nation because it's in the hearts that the thrones exist. The hearts of the people are literally the heart of the nation. And we have a big job in front of us to change the hearts of the people because while nobody was looking and while a lot of Christians had their heads down and stuck in the sand, and while a lot of Christians and Christ people, men of God, were building their own kingdoms, the hearts of the nation were being stolen. It was, it was the hearts of the people that had been led astray. Much the same way Absalom stood outside the gate and stood beside the gate of the city and said, if I were the king, I would rule in your favor. I would give you this. I would give you that. I promise you. I, I, I promise you. I'll do this. I'll do that for you. And it was in that way that the hearts of the people were led astray. The same thing has happened in our country. We have lost the educational system. We have lost the healthcare industry. We have lost the media. We have lost a lot of the government. We have lost the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? Because while we were looking somewhere else, 
there was a usurper that was sitting outside of the gate, stealing those hearts one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And years and years and years have gone by. And now our God, our God, who has the right to rule and reign, who should be firmly ensconced in our hearts, has been left out and is sitting outside with his face pressed up against the window, waiting to be escorted back to his proper place, to his rightful place. Who's on the throne of our heart today? And you might not think it, but we have the authority in this room to change the atmosphere. We have the voice. It starts with us. Who's on your throne? Who's on the throne of our heart? Father God, thank you for your word today. And Lord, I, right now, Lord, I pray for our country. Lord, I, right now, I just speak to the hearts of Americans everywhere. Lord, I pray that the sound that would leave this room would be the sound of victory. Lord, it would be the sound of men and women everywhere that would be escorting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to his rightful throne. And Lord, we know that there's coming a day when Jesus is going to come back and he is going to rule and reign. And we know, Lord, that you said that some point every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I speak to that right now. Lord, I just pray that the sound that would go out of this room would cause the hearts mm -hmm. of men and women to bring back the King of Kings and put him on the throne that he deserves. Thank you for your word.